Um, so your rocket company, Blue Origin, yeah. is really taking off, doing well. How do you see um, that company you know, evolving in the future, future of space, anything well, you want to share on Blue Origin? So, okay, first of all, I love space. I have been a space lover since I was a five-year-old boy. And I feel like I won the lottery with Amazon. I know I won the lottery. And, uh, and now I'm investing those lottery winnings in Blue Origin, which is uh, the space company. Um, we, built, we're built, we are flying a, a suborbital tourism vehicle, and we'll start taking people up hopefully in 2018. That's coming right up. Working on it for more than 10 years. I, I, uh, hopefully, this, one, this, this overnight success is taking longer than 10 years. I don't know. We'll see. You know. uh, and we're also building an orbital vehicle called New Glenn. New Shepard is named after Alan Shepard, the first American in space. He went on a suborbital journey. New Glenn is named after the American hero, John Glenn, who uh, was the first American to orbit the Earth. Uh, and so uh, these are both, these are reusable. Uh, boosters, fully reusable. That's the key to lowering the cost. Our vision at Blue Origin is that we want millions of people living and working in space. And my personal hope is that I live long enough to see um, the kind of dynamism in space. I want to see a whole economy, entrepreneurs in space that I got to witness over the last 20 years on the internet. You know, um, the, the problem with being an entrepreneur in the space arena is that the price of admission is so darn high. So, it, you know, to do interesting things in space, the beginning, you know, kind of the beginning entry level is a few hundred million dollars. So you're not going to get, you know, two kids in their dorm room doing something amazing in space. Whereas, that's literally what happened to Facebook, right? So on the internet, because the price of admission is so low, you can get these amazing experiments where like one kid in a dorm room does something and it turns into Facebook. And, or, you know, Amazon's case, you know, I started this thing with an incredibly small amount of capital and the, you know, it was able to grow because we didn't need a lot to get to, to begin with. The heavy lifting was in place for Amazon, right? So I didn't need to build a transportation network it existed already. It was UPS and the Royal Mail and the US Postal Service and Deutsche Post and so on and so on. I didn't have to build a telecommunications backbone to connect with my customers. It was there. It was called the internet. And in fact, the internet was resting on top of the long distance phone network at that time. You guys remember the dial up modem? Some of you do. Some of you were too young to. Re Some of you should go to a museum and see a dial up modem. What was that sound? And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so. I, want, I, I recently showed a group of youngsters a payphone. I came across one, and I was like, my god, guys, come over here. This may be the last one. You have to see it. Um, and uh, so you know, the point is that Amazon was, got to rest on top of, we didn't have to build a payment system. It already existed. It was called the credit card. Um, computers were already on every desk, thanks to you know Microsoft, IBM, and Apple, and you know, but what were they being used for? To play games, not to buy things on Amazon, and so all that heavy lifting was in place. And I want to, you know, my greatest, uh, 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 I would have such a good feeling if I could be an 80-year-old guy and laying there thinking about my life, if I could say, look, there is um, now a bunch of entrepreneurs in space because. I took my Amazon lottery winnings and built the heavy lifting infrastructure that does take billions of dollars in capex to lower the cost of access to space. That's how you get millions of people living and working. And by the way, we need that. For those of you who like to think about the future at all, um, you can do a simple calculation. You know, we, we can argue about um, you know, what limited resources on Earth and so on and so on. But here's a calculation that you cannot argue with which is you take current baseline energy usage on Earth, compound it at just a few percent a year for just a few hundred years, and you have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. So you have to, we're going to have to decide, do we want a society of pioneering, invention, expansion, growth, or do we want a society of stasis? 
And personally, I believe, because the earth is finite. And if you want a society of stasis, I think it's good. First of all, I don't personally believe that stasis is even compatible with freedom. So I think for me, that's a big problem. Second of all, it's going to be dull. Stasis is going to be very dull. You don't want to live in the stasis world. And so, of course, we're going to continue to get more efficient, too. We have been. For hundreds of years, we've been getting more productive, more efficient. That's, that trend is going to continue. Um, but even so, we're going to want to use more energy, more energy per capita. And also, I don't want to stabilize population. I would love for there to be a trillion humans in the solar system. With a trillion humans, we would have a thousand Einsteins and a thousand Mozarts. It'd be an incredible symbol. Don't you want that dynamism? It'd be so much more interesting. My, this is for your great, great, great grandchildren. But what kind of world do you want them to live in? 